everybody. Today we are going to talk about joints for lab. And so with that, let's get started. So these are the learning goals of um, today's lab lecture and assignments. And let's go ahead and get started. I know we've already covered this in lecture and so hopefully this is just a quick summary and review and um, this week's lab will be super easy for you. All right, so let's just review what a joint actually is. This is a location where two bones are meeting and they're touching, also called articulating, with each other. Okay, so an example here would be the femur and the tibia. This is uh, a place that's going to be touching. Um, additionally, the the patella is going to touch the femur. These are both joints and actually together collectively, this is the knee joint. The purpose of joints then is to provide stability at places where two bones are meeting and also allow movement because muscles tend to cross over these joints and allow us to move um, our, our bones efficiently and effectively. Keep in mind that a lot of times um, joints also have these extra structures called bursa. And bursa are just sacs of synovial fluid that is going to be found um, where tendons are crossing bones and joints. Okay, so for example, in the knee joint, we have the quadriceps tendon um, and then the patellar ligament. So where the tendon is crossing, this joint, we actually do have what's called the prepatellar bursa. And so sometimes, um, kind of speaking clinically here, what can happen is a condition called bursitis. And if you remember back from the lecture from Biology 2310, I think the, I lectured on that either last week or two weeks ago, um, I talked to you guys a little bit about prepatellar bursitis um, and also called housemaid's knee. So um, bursitis just refers to the inflammation of the bursa within a joint and it doesn't have to be the, the knee joint. Um, prepatellar bursitis has to do with the knee joint but um, bursa can be inflamed in any joint in which they're present. So prepatellar bursitis, um, this is just a little clinical picture for you guys. Um, the prepatellar bursa is located out front of the patella and the bursa then is just filled with uh, synovial fluid that helps decrease friction and it maintains a really good range of motion for the knee. Um, but prepatellar bursitis is also called housemaid's knee. Um, is caused by repeated kneeling that causes continuous um, sort of trauma to this bursa. And as a result, the bursa can become inflamed, um, therefore causing swelling pain, maybe redness, and um, actually prevents you from flexing your knee. Um, it's very common in roofers, plumbers, carpet layers, um, and used to be more uh, common where it got its name is from housemaids. So this is called housemaid's knee. Um, in terms of treating this condition, normally rest, cold pack, um, maybe some anti-inflammatory drugs. And then once the pain and the swelling are gone, uh, heat should be applied to the area because heat helps to improve circulation, which therefore the white blood cells, the, the healing cells can help um, heal, heal the damage here. So that's just a little clinical information for you today. So whenever we are, again, functionally and structurally classifying joints, um, we would functionally classify them as being either synarthroses, which are completely immovable joints like the sutures of the skull. Um, so remember we talked about the uh, coronal suture, the sagittal suture, lamboid suture, uh, squamous suture, all those sutures on the skull are examples of synarthroses or immovable joints. Amphiarthroses are slightly movable joints. Um, and so an example of that would be like the pubic symphysis, which is located in between the two hip bones, um, specifically between the two uh, pubic bones. And this one is a slightly movable joint, um, especially in women. Um, 
it becomes a little bit more slightly movable because during um, childbirth, hormones actually act on the pubic symphysis to increase its stretchiness so that the head of the baby can fit through the birth canal. Um, so an amphiarthrosis is a slightly movable joint such as the pubic symphysis. And then finally, diarthroses are also called synovial joints, and these are joints that are freely movable. And we structurally classify these joints um, and put them into six different types, six different subcategories of synovial joints. So the first subcategory are these pivot joints. Um, and a pivot joint has one fixed area and one rotating bone. So a joint is the articulation between two bones. So one bone would be fixed or, or doesn't move and then the other bone moves. So an example of this would be that lenoaxial joint um, between the C1 and C2 vertebra, the one that allows us to shake our head no. Additionally, the proximal radio ulna joint, so the point where the radius and the ulna are meeting closer to the elbow, is also a pivot joint um, because if you remember going from supination to pronation, I talked about this in lecture, um, it's the radius rotating over the ulna. The ulna isn't actually moving, but the radius is just rotating over the ulna. Um, and so again, an example of a pivot joint. Hinge joints um, have sort of one plane of motion. Um, and so an example of this would be your elbow joint. It's like, I think about like a door, a door hinge. So you can either open the door or you can close the door. Um, that's the exact kind of uh, motion and, and uh, correlation that I can give you here for a hinge joint. Um, saddle joints. An example of this would be the thumb. Um, and so the thumb between the trapezium, which is one of the carpal bones, and the thumb, you have uh, motion in one direction. And then you also have motion in a separate direction between the um, thumb and the, um, the first metacarpal or yeah, the first, I'm sorry, the first metacarpal as well. So you have two um, sort of ranges here of motion. Next are the plain synovial joints. And these are mostly just gliding uh, joints. So I think of um, if you put a box on the floor, you can move it forwards and backwards and you can move it side to side. Um, but in order to stay in contact with the floor, you can't move it up and down. All right, so it's really only two um, planes of motion here side to side and, and front to back. And so the example that is in the human body would be in places such as between the tarsal bones, um, also between the vertebra, and additionally between the carpals. The next subcategory here are the condyloid joints. And condyloid um, joints example here is of condyloid joints would be between um, the radius and the carpals. Um, so you sort of have this motion where you can slide around this, I guess, uh, smooth surface, but a little bit more in a circular motion, okay? And also the metacarpophalangeal joints um, allow us to perform this same sort of circumducted um, motion. So you can kind of move your fingers in circles. Okay, so that's the metacarpophalangeal joints. And you can kind of move your wrist um, in a circle. And so that is the radiocarpal joint. Okay, and then finally, the ball and socket joints. Um, we have two of them in the body. We have the, the shoulder joint and the hip joint. Um, and these allow all of the motions. So you have flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, circumduction. I mean, all of the above you can perform at ball and socket joints. And if you want a video on um, classifying the six types of synovial joints, you can go to this link here and um, it's a pretty good video. Okay, so now I'm going to start talking to you guys about the shoulder joint. 
The shoulder joint is also called the glenohumeral joint, and it's located in the proximal part of the upper limb. Um, as I just mentioned, it is a ball and socket type of synovial joint, which means it has a wide range of motions and movements, including flexion and extension, abduction and adduction, medial and lateral rotation, and circumduction. This is the most mobile joint in the body. So which bones are actually articulating to make up this joint? Um, and the first bone that we'll look at is the humerus. So, the feature of the humerus that articulates as part of the glenohumeral joint is this smooth articular surface here, the, um, the head of the humerus. The other feature of the humerus that's kind of related uh, to structures that help to stabilize the joint um, are these two areas here on the anterior aspect of the proximal humerus, which are respectively the uh, lesser and greater tubercles and we learned about them. And between them, we have this intertubercular um, groove or intertubercular sulcus. And while we're here, I'd also like to point out the anatomical neck of the humerus. So the anatomical neck is going around this way. Um, all of these features are attachment sites for structures that help to stabilize the shoulder joint. Okay, and so, um, the next bone that we talk about in the shoulder joint is the scapula. Um, this triangular flat bone has some key features that are particularly relevant um, to the shoulder joint itself. And we will look at them from the anterior aspect, which you're probably used to. And eventually, um, here in a couple minutes, we'll look at them from the more unusual lateral view. Um, which is pretty important for this lecture. So the surface of the scapula that articulates in the shoulder joint is called the glenoid cavity. And it's from the lateral aspect of the scapula, um, which is highlighted here in green. Uh, we'll see this again later on in, in a different picture. Um, the bony projection that is superior to the shoulder joint is called the acromion, as we hopefully remember, the acromion process. Um, you can try palpating this on yourself. If you find the long hard ridge on the back of your shoulder and follow it laterally and superiorly, um, when you come to the end just above your shoulder joint, you'll have found your acromion. Okay, and then finally the process, um, the bony feature that kind of projects anteriorly here is the coracoid process. And I mentioned these things because they are, um, quite important in helping to stabilize the shoulder joint. So the image that I'm going to look at uh, next, that we're going to look at together next, is going to be with the humerus actually removed from the shoulder joint. And because of this, we can actually see uh, into the joint itself and get a better idea of how ligaments and muscles interact with the joint. So in this image, we see the uh, scapula here and its surrounding muscles um, sort of isolated from the humerus and also sort of isolated from the rest of the body. And um, we're looking from a lateral view. So anything to the right up here is then the anterior aspect and anything then to the left, it, this is all the posterior aspect over here. Um, and from this lateral view, we can still see those same features of the scapula that we just identified before. We can still see the um, glenoid cavity for the most part. Um, and I'll kind of touch base on this in a second because this says glenoid labrum, but I'll, I'll tell you why here in a second. Um, we can still see um, the acromion, we can still see the coracoid, and it's important to note that actually the acromion, which you see up here, um, doesn't actually contribute to the glenohumeral joint, but it does articulate with the clavicle, uh, which you can see here, it does articulate with the clavicle, um, which helps form that pectoral girdle that we talked about in lab when we did upper extremity. Um, and then finally, the final feature we'll look at is this, um, the coracoid process. Um, again, it, 
doesn't articulate with any other bones, but it is an important attachment site for ligaments that help stabilize the shoulder joint. All right, so that's kind of the basics um, bone-wise structured uh, sort of covered. So let's get into the joint itself and see what we can find in there. So I know <laughs> this is like the third time um, that I'm saying this, but I promise you it's the last time. Um, so again, there's just a couple of things that I want to point out. And in order to understand the shoulder joint, it's really just best to look at it from an anterior aspect. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do. So remember we said that the shoulder joint is a ball and socket joint. Um, well, the glenoid cavity, also called the glenoid fossa. So here, the glenoid cavity. Um, is also, um, it, it forms part of the socket, uh, it forms the socket part, excuse me, of the joint. And as you can see from its very shallow curve here, um, although it is the socket portion, it's just not a very good one. And in addition, the surface area of the head of the humerus is like four times bigger than that of the glenoid cavity. So as you can imagine, um, that results in a relatively small contact area between these two at any given time. This is beneficial for us though, because in terms of mobility of the joint, um, we're able to perform a lot more movements, movements, but it means that the stability of the joint here is relatively compromised. There are, however, some extra structures that help to support the shoulder joint and give it some extra stability. Um, actually, in fact, the shoulder joint, I think it relies on more um, I read that it relied on more the surrounding muscles and ligaments for stability than it does on its bony elements. Um, and so the first structure that I'll talk to you about is the um, <clears throat> glenoid labrum. And so glenoid labrum is this fibrocartilaginous ring attaching around the outer margin of the glenoid fossa. Um, and the purpose of this is just to, so anything that you kind of see in blue here is labrum. Just deep to this is where you would find the bony part of the glenoid um, cavity. So the glenoid labrum, again, is this fibrocartilaginous ring. It sort of attaches um, to the outer margin of the glenoid fossa. And basically it functions to help deepen the glenoid fossa, giving the socket part of the joint a little bit more of a functional socket shape. Okay, and so surrounding the glenoid, um, the, the glenohumeral joint or the, the shoulder joint is the joint capsule. Um, and you see this sort of translucent area here um, is the joint capsule. Now, like all synovial joints, the joint capsule is made from like the outer fibrous layer, inner synovial layer. Um, and it's easy to forget looking at the lateral aspect that the structures actually extend beyond the plane of the glenoid cavity. Um, but the part of the joint capsule itself actually engulfs the entire humeral head. Um, so if you put the humeral head back in place, the joint capsule actually includes um, wrapping around the humeral head. And it actually extends far beyond the margin of the articular surface. Um, and it goes all the way to the anatomical neck. Okay, so this joint capsule, when you put the humerus back in place, wraps all the way around the head and functions and goes all the way down to this anatomical neck. The glenoid cavity together with this capsule forms sort of a spherical space around the humeral head um, and that's called the acetabulum. The joint capsule doesn't do all the work alone, but although, um, so anterior and inferiorly, the joint capsule is strengthened by some ligaments, which we're gonna look at next, okay? So the first um, of these ligaments, so that's where we're at now. The first ligament we're gonna look at is um, the corcohumeral ligament. And so this one you're gonna see here, okay, corcohumeral ligament. And you'll notice that its name is actually quite indicative of its attachments, okay? So we can just about see it running from the posterior aspect of the coracoid process. So if you kind of 
um, were able to see through this area, you could see that the coracohumeral ligament is attaching to the posterior aspect of the coracoid process. Um, and <clears throat> then it's going to continue down and insert on the humerus, um, which is exactly what we can see here. And from this anterior view, we can't see the attachment of the ligament on the coracoid process very well. Um, and again, that's just because it's coming from the posterior aspect of this. So this, this uh, ligament is going to flare out. As you can see, it's going to attach to the lesser and the greater tubercle, respectively, of the humerus. Um, and the coracohumeral ligament is important in preventing inferior dislocation of the humerus. So make sure we don't dislocate the humerus inferiorly or downward. All right, so next up, we are looking at a set of uh, three glenohumeral ligaments. Um, starting with the superior glenohumeral ligament, um, it would be, okay, for all intents and purposes, I'm gonna try to draw this, I'm sorry, it's not fantastic. Okay. And then there. All right. So we're going to say this is superior. So that's middle. And this one's inferior. Okay. So glenohumeral ligaments. Superior glenohumeral ligament spans from the joint. Um, sort of just above the glenoid cavity called the glenoid tubercle. Um, and it's gonna go to the medial ridge of the intertubercular sulcus, all right? So it's gonna come, it's gonna pass underneath the tendon of the subscap uh, muscle and transverse humeral um, ligament. And it's essentially just going to pop right there in between the um, two tubercles in that intertubercular space, okay? This ligament actually works with the corcohumeral ligament, which I'm sure you can kind of imagine, in helping to prevent inferior dis, um, dislocation of the humerus, right? Because it's almost in the same location as the corcohumeral ligament, and its fiber directions are running almost identically. So you can imagine that um, these two work together to prevent the humerus from dislocated, uh, from dislocating inferiorly. So next we will come across the middle um, glenohumeral ligament, which I have labeled here with an M. And um, this ligament is across the anterior aspect of the joint. So it originates um, just below the superior glenohumeral ligament and then comes across and inserts onto the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The middle glenohumeral ligament really, its whole job in life is to add um, anterior stability of the joint so that the humerus doesn't slip too far forward or too far kind of coming at you if you can imagine um, that would this uh, uh, ligament prevents it the humerus from coming sort of out of the screen towards us and then um, the last of the glenohumeral ligaments is the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And as I'm sure you've guessed, it's the ligament that runs across the inferior aspect of the joint. Um, it mostly originally originates along the inferior portion. Oops, excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, so it mostly originates, originates along this inferior portion of the glenoid cavity. Um, and it... Um, laterally goes to the neck. So laterally it's going to come um, and attach onto the neck. Okay. A little note here is that um, all of these ligaments, so I'm going to clear my drawings and I mean it's important to know that all these ligaments actually um, they just blend with the capsule and they're not clearly distinguishable. Okay, and so the last uh, ligament or supporting ligament that we're going to look at um, is quite different from the ones that we've talked about already. 
So um, this is the Corco acromial ligament. And um, from this anterior view, we can see that it's running from the coracoid process anteriorly to the um, acromion, which is more posterior. And hopefully you can see how this ligament would um, provide sort of a superior arch above the humerus, which will help to prevent uh, any kind of superior dislocation. Okay, so that is the shoulder joint. And then um, I think next we have the knee joint. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the knee joint, which is a synovial hinge joint that is formed by three bones and several soft tissue structures. So here we can see the knee joint um, highlighted from its anterior perspective. And as I mentioned, the knee joint is a synovial hinged joint, which is formed by three bones, including the femur, the patella, and the tibia. And to a lesser extent, the fibula, not technically part of the knee joint, but it's an accessory structure. Okay, so um, distally, sorry, my mouse is like going crazy for a second. Distally, the femur has two condyles. We have a medial um, condyle and we have a lateral condyle, which articulate with the tibia. Um, we can see both condyles here, and this specific articulation of the femoral condyles with the tibia is also sometimes referred to as the tibiofemoral joint. Um, and so these structures also articulate with the patella at what's known as the patellofemoral joint. And the patellar surface is formed by the medial and the lateral condyles. Um, and it's where the patella articulates with the femur. And you may have noticed that the condyles here, they appear to have a different texture compared with the surrounding bone. Um, and this is because they're covered with articular cartilage, which provides a smooth um, articular surface and allows for more efficient movement of the joint. Okay, so now that we're sort of familiar with the knee joint, let's move on to um, some of the um, more, some more structures. Okay, and so here we can see the patella um, reflected and still embedded within its tendon and ligament. Um, the patella is the largest sesamoid bone in the body, which means that it's formed within a tendon, specifically the quadriceps tendon. Um, the posterior surface of the patella is um, what articulates with the femur. And so it would be lined with articular cartilage to prevent that bone on bone rubbing. And as for function, the patella um, covers and it protects the anterior surface of the knee joint. And it also functions as sort of an anatomic pulley um, for the quadriceps femoris muscle, which provides the quads with better mechanical advantage over the knee joint and thus allows for more effective knee extension. All right, so as for the tibia then, the tibia is the shin bone, the leg bone, and like the femur, it also has medial and lateral condyles, um, and <clears throat> together the tibial condyles form what are the medial and lateral tibial plateaus, which we should know by now, hopefully, and this smooth bony surface is what's articulating with the femoral condyles. Right, and so they appear, um, the femoral condyles appear blue, the tibial plateaus appear blue, um, and the articular surface of the patella also appears blue because these are the um, surfaces that are touching each other. All right, so um, in between, um, back to the tibia, so in between the tibial plateaus, we had the little um, sort of mountain ridge if you can remember back to the bones lecture, um, that, that was called the intercondylar eminence. 
Um, and then, although it's not shown in this picture, um, kind of like it was in the shoulder picture, it's worth mentioning that the knee joint is also encapsulated by the articular capsule, um, which again has an outer fibrous layer and an inner synovial layer. Um, and the outer fibrous layer just provides that overall stability and the synovial layer um, lubricates the structures within the joint to provide um, more smooth movements. So um, before we go on looking at the uh, ligaments of the knee, um, let's have a quick chat about the menisci. And so humans have two menisci. We have a medial meniscus and a lateral meniscus, both of which we can see here from the anterior perspective. Um, the menisci are these C-shaped structures and they attach to the intercondylar area of the um, tibia. And these are fibrocartilaginous structures which function to then the articular surface of the tibia, which helps to increase stability of the knee joint. And the menisci also act as little shock absorbers, which cushions the tibia from forces that are generated during movement of the knee, such as like when we're walking um, or when we're flexing our knee. Uh, so the medial meniscus, which you can see over here, it's actually more C-shaped than the lateral meniscus. Um, so the medial meniscus is also attached to the medial collateral or sometimes called the tibial collateral ligament. Um, and therefore the medial meniscus is vulnerable to injury whenever the MCL is disturbed. Um, whereas the lateral meniscus doesn't possess any additional attachments and it's actually just more circular and shaped rather than just C-shaped. <clears throat> All right, so time to move on and talk about the ligaments of the knee joint. So first we're gonna look at the extracapsular ligaments, so the ones that would be outside of the joint capsule. And that's gonna, we're gonna start with the um, collateral ligaments. And so uh, here we can see the tibial collateral ligament, um, more commonly known as the medial collateral ligament or MCL. Um, and then also the lateral collateral ligament, um, which is also called the fibular collateral ligament, but not that many people ter use that term. So um, this is more commonly referred to as the lateral collateral ligament, the LCL. So back to the medial collateral ligament, MCL, um, it extends from the uh, medial epicondyle of the femur and also attaches to the medial meniscus. Um, and then finally, the medial uh, condyle of the tibia. And this ligament basically limits extension and abduction of the lower leg. Okay, so it prevents the lower leg from extending, so from your knee buckling, um, and then it also prevents your knee from kind of going out, your lower leg rather, your ankle, if you can imagine, like buckling outwards, okay? If you hear my dog barking, I'm really sorry recording from home. Okay, so the lateral collateral ligament or fibular collateral ligament, but the LCL, um, it extends from the lateral epicondyle of the femur to the head of the fibula. And this ligament basically limits extension and adduction of the lower leg, okay? So, Let's talk about a ligament that I mentioned earlier, the patellar ligament. Um, the patellar ligament is the continuation of the quadriceps tendon, and the patellar ligament inserts onto the tibial tuberosity. And this ligament basically is essential for extending the knee joint, and also it helps to protect the anterior aspect of the knee joint. And so this is the one actually that um, whenever you have your uh, knee jerk reflex tested, so you take um, an instrument and you uh, hit a specific spot just below your patella, just below your kneecap and your leg extends out, um, that is kind of showing you the action then of the patellar ligament and its assistance in providing knee extension. So now that we've discussed 
um, the extracapsular ligaments, we can move on to the intracapsular ligaments, which is going to be the ACL and the PCL. Um, and here we can see both the ACL and the PCL. And um, interesting facts, so the ACL stands for anterior cruciate ligament and then posterior cruciate ligament. Um, the word cruciate uh, in Latin means cross. And if we look at our images, we can see where these ligaments get their name um, as together they form a cross-like symbol. Okay, and so the anterior cruciate ligament um, runs between the anterior intercondylar region of the tibia and the lateral femoral condyle. And this ligament, the anterior collateral, or excuse me, anterior cruciate ligament um, prevents anterior dislocation of the knee joint, whereas the posterior cruciate ligament runs between the posterior intercondylar region of the tibia, so back here behind the ACL, um, and then it also slides more anteriorly until it attaches um, to the um, sort of inside of the medial femoral condyle. And the PCL would prevent posterior dislocation of the knee joint. And so there you have it. Um, that is kind of the knee joint as a whole. And um, so now we can move on to motions of synovial and cartilaginous joints. And so these should not be new motions to you. Um, I'm probably really not even going to talk too much about them. I'm just going to go through and show you the pictures um, because hopefully at this point you should know what these different motions are. However, I did include a video if you want to watch this video on your own. It's really goofy and quirky, but it's kind of fun. Um, and so go ahead um, and watch that video on your own if you, if you so please. So let's talk about these motions. We have abduction, so moving away from the midline, and adduction. So abduction is away, adduction is towards the midline of the body. So we can do this with our arms, uh, we can do this with our legs. So abduct, move your leg out. Uh, adduct is move it back in. We have flexion and extension. So flexion um, would be moving a limb forward um, or your head, moving your head forward. Extension would be moving it backwards. So um, your leg as a whole, you extend your whole leg, you kind of move your whole leg back, just like your arm would be going back. But if you extend your knee, um, you're going from a flexed position to a straight position, okay? And then extension of the head is looking up towards the ceiling. Flexion of the head is looking down towards your chest, okay? And rotation, um, would be like at the atlanoaxial joint, so the C1, C2 joint where shaking your head no, um, that would be rotation. In addition, we have medial and lateral rotation of our arms and our legs, and so medial rotation uh, would be um, sort of going inward toward, towards the medial side, and then uh, lateral rotation would be taking your whole leg and sort of um, pointing your feet outwards, okay? And so that would be lateral rotation. And then circumduction is moving in a circle. Dorsiflexion is pulling your toes um, up towards your shin. Plantar flexion, it would be planting your foot. Supination is holding a bowl of soup up. Um, or if you see waitresses like holding a tray, their arms are in supination. And then pronation would be <clears throat> turning your arm palm down. Inversion would be moving the sole of your foot um, medially. So kind of the common way to roll your ankle would be um, an inversion injury. And then eversion would be pointing the sole of your foot towards the outside of the body. 
opposition would be um, occurring in, at the thumb joint. And so if you bring your thumb and your pinky together or do like the number four sign um, with your fingers, you are opposing your thumb and then putting it back into its original position is called reposition. Protraction and retraction. So protraction would refer to pulling your jaw forward, getting yourself kind of an underbite, and then retraction would be bringing it back and putting it um, back into its normal position of overbite. Elevation would be like shrugging your shoulders and depression would be like bringing them back down. And that is all I have for today's lecture. So hopefully you learned some new stuff that you didn't know. Um, and go ahead and take those quizzes and do those assignments.